and go. Hello and welcome to CMC Markets and this pre-FOMC webinar where Colin Szynski in Toronto and myself, Michael Hewson, here in London, preview this evening's Federal Reserve rate decision. But before we get to that, I think it's also important to look at this through the prism of what the Bank of Japan did this morning because ultimately I think the biggest mover I think of these combined central bank moves could well be dollar yen. We've already seen a 200 point move in dollar yen today. Um, I have to get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way first so I'll put the disclaimers up while I'm talking so that uh, you can digest the disclaimers, the risk warnings and what have you. But the biggest mover today thus far is we, we've seen is in dollar yen. We've seen a move up to 102.70 and we saw also a very sharp rise in the Nikkei as well. Now Japan is off tomorrow so I think the fact that dollar yen has since declined after the Japanese close could actually have repercussions for where the Nikkei opens early on Friday morning because ultimately once 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 Japan gets back off its holiday we could find we could well find that we get a little bit of an air pocket open up in do not in dollar yen but in the Nikkei because a strong yen does not help Japanese exporters and a strong yen hurts the Nikkei so first and foremost on, on it, go on oh just sorry I, I just mentioned because it's the Japanese holiday that also means that the the effect of, of whatever we do get today is going to reverberate through the rest of the week because some people will have it will have a chance to trade it today some people tomorrow the Japanese not till Friday so it's going to be uh, this is going to be an ongoing reaction that can spark uh, market swings for the next several days and I think and I think that really is the is the key the key component to all of this. What happens over the next few hours is going to affect market trading into the rest of this week. So let's actually dissect what the Japanese did today because ultimately, despite the fact that they didn't cut rates, which I have to say um, wasn't entirely unexpected. I think what they've done today is pretty much an admission the the negative rate policy that they brought into place in January this year was a mistake and, yeah, and on that Michael even the the uh, the small cut to 0 0.2 negative rates that had been kicked around mm. wouldn't really have been much of a cut anyways no it wouldn't but it certainly wouldn't have made um, the profitability or the margins of Japanese banks any better and I think this is what Absolutely. this and I think this is what this is all about I think this tweaking of the yield curve um, so that is that there's there's much more of a gradient in terms of short dates, short rates, and long rates is an attempt to try and restore that big margin between borrowing short and lending long. Ultimately, I think it's doomed to failure, simply because certainly if you look at the spreads between the twos and the tens, for example, or the fives and the thirties, they they'd already widened out quite significantly already between the lows that we saw in June and where they are now and then, and they're now coming back and I think the market reaction is actually a, a direct effect of that because ultimately Japanese 10-year yields closed at minus 0.06 percent last night so the Bank of Japan's efforts to basically orientate 10-year yields back around zero is actually a fiscal tightening not a fiscal loosening and that is essentially why you're seeing the yen start to gain as people started to dissect the decision the fact of the matter is this tinkering around the edges is not going to help the Japanese economy it could help the banks but I don't think it will change the overall economic outlook at all and that's why I think you're seeing the move in dollar yen and I think also that uh, what we saw initially with some of the early reactions was people were trying to paint this as a kind of easing or a different type. But what it's really like is what the uh, the Fed tried to do a few years ago with their twist operation. And that ended up not really, work, not really working at all. And they ended up coming back with more QE as, as they needed. But in, in this particular case, I, I think, and Michael will agree, that, uh, that between the Bank of Japan today and the ECB last week, one message we're getting is we're reaching the end of what the central banks can do in terms of easing and that negative rates are having a negative impact on the banking sector. We've seen that in Europe this year and that the uh, it's going to take some creativity and, and things that people are going to start looking, start looking in other directions. And I think that's the big takeaway and I think we heard an awful lot about 
the risks of cutting rates too low um, in the aftermath of the Bank of England rate decision to cut rates to 0.25 percent we have, we saw mm -hmm. gilt yields slump sharply and we heard pension funds complain about the fact that their pension deficits were soaring so on the one hand you're getting long-term effects where you're not going to see the effects of it for at least 10 or 15 years out the short-term effects are you're hurting bank profit margins and ultimately I think when people realize that they're going to have to save a lot more to actually have the same sort of a lifestyle that current pensioners are actually accustomed to they're going to save more they're not going to spend more they're going to actually save more money so actually negative effect negative rates completely overlooked overlook human psychology if people are uncertain about how much money they're going to have in the future they're not going to spend it they're going to save it because they're going to need more for the future they're not going to need less and ultimately that's why Absolutely. I think negative rates are counterproductive and I think central banks are suddenly growing or coming to that realization and I think that's why it's unlikely that we'll see the European Central Bank cut rates further either they're already they're already at minus 0.4 there's already significant resistance from the German banks about the effects of negative rates and you've only got to look at Deutsche Bank share price to understand that for all the concerns about the Italian banking sector the biggest elephant in the room right now is Deutsche Bank um, but that's going off topic ever so slightly in terms of what the Bank of Japan have done today it's basically taking a pea shooter to a gunfight and ultimately I don't think that it will work <laughs> yeah. And we're seeing that. This is the Nikkei. This is where the Nikkei closed earlier today. And in our short term Nikkei or Japan 225 chart, as dollar yen has slid back, we can see that the, the, the Nikkei has also slid back. Not as much because obviously it's a, it's a futures derivative contract. But ultimately, I think if you compare it to what dollar yen has done today, it's quite plain to see here. And I've posted an awful lot of charts on dollar yen. Um, and on the chart forums over the course of the past few months this cloud Ichimoku cloud resistance has acted as a real significant barrier for the decline in dollar yen since those peaks in December now we can see where the negative rates came in at the end of January here we got an initial pop higher in the same way that we got today and then suddenly since then since negative rates came in dollar yen has continued to decline well below the cloud resistance here and here and once again here so the line of least resistance for dollar yen at the moment unless unless auntie janet pulls a rabbit out of the fed hat tonight and helps out the bank of japan the bank of japan would love that they would love they would love the fed to raise rates tonight Unfortunately, I do not think that they will see that wish granted, which means that for, for dollar yen, the line of least resistance on this chart here is is down. And we can see that rep indicated here in this Ichimoku Kumo cloud here, which is something that I use all on, on most of my yen related charts simply because it's it tends to be a fairly decent indicator of trend. And it is a trend indicator and it is very, very important. Um, and for me, I think the trend will remain down while we remain below 102.50 and 103.20. That is basically the cloud resistance here. It's going to take something substantive to really push us through these September highs here. If we get through the September highs, then I see there's a significant chance we can come back to 107. But ultimately, it's going to need something substantive to really push us through 103. And we tried, we tried it this morning didn't work it gave up those gains and now we're back down here so we are now it was looking... a pretty serious failure this morning it is it's a very significant it's... failure on top of that because it also failed it also failed at the um at one of the averages i think it was a 50 and at 103 and also it, there's a falling channel in there mm. and uh, and that all, it also failed at that so it was a pretty major failure at 103 this morning and if you put it in the context of what it's what's happened here is we've taken out the highs of this day here this day here here and here so we've taken out the last four days highs so it's ripped out all the stop losses and dollar yen and now it's lower that's a very bad sign for sentiment so depending on what happens tonight and let's face it this is a daily candle chart so it hasn't yet closed so where we close tonight could well dictate where dollar yen goes to next and I think this is why the Fed meeting this morning is important in the context 
of where we go to next relative to the move in dollar yen but ultimately I think the dollar the, the risky side for the dollar is not the upside the, the risky side is the downside I think the dollar could well weaken into year end and there is a chart that I would like to show you and, and, and I'll go into a little bit of detail as to why this Fed meeting is important but what I'm going to show you first is Colin wants to talk to you about the um, FOMC economic projections of the Federal Reserve board members and the dot plot charts. Now I'm very skeptical about the dot plots. Personally I think they're about as much use as a glass eye on a frosty morning. However um, policy makers do look at them. They are there for a reason but if you looked at the dot plot charts and they're on the screen now I'll let Colin talk you through them. Thanks, Michael. So what we're looking at for the Fed meeting today and what we've seen from the ECB and the Bank of Japan is a lot of people were expecting that they'd go mega dovish, which would make it hard for the Fed to raise rates and go the other way. They've both gone to neutral. We're near the end of this monetary easing cycle. We're way out at one end of the pendulum and we're slowly starting to come back the other way. The question is for the Fed, they're, late, they're going to raise rates sometime in the next few months. The question is when? Are they going to do it now? Are they going to do it in December or hold off until early? next year. I personally am leaning towards December. I think that this meeting is a little bit too soon. I, I'm figuring about a 30-40% chance of a hike today and 60-70% uh, chance they'll hold off till December. There's a number of ways that the Fed can signal a rate hike in December. You can see more descending votes in, in, the, in the FOMC statement and they've got the dot plot and also the um, the member projections for this uh, month coming out uh, as well, plus the press conference. So they've got a lot of tools they can use. The uh, the dot plot, what we'll probably be looking at this time, is to see it center around one rate hike this year if you don't get one today. That would forecast towards December. Well, what's more important is as we look out to these future years, we're still looking here at, at people thinking that there's going to be three and four interest uh, percent in interest rates farther out, and, and that's simply not true. The... Uh, the, uh, a number of the Fed members have been increasingly coming around to the idea that the neutral rate for this cycle is probably one percent or one and a quarter percent. So uh, not not two or two and a half percent. I, I, we're looking at two percent inflation. That would probably people would usually consider that to be the neutral rate. This cycle, it started with uh, Leo Brainerd and, and a number of uh, other Fed members have have are basically have increasingly agreed with her. It's more like one and a, one and a quarter percent. So if we get one rate hike this year, to bring us up to 0.75 you're looking at one or two more in 2016 27 or sorry just lost the audio Colin Colin I've just lost your audio it appears we've lost Colin you need to check your microphone going farther out you need to check your microphone. I just lost the audio hey, Michael, there. For about there? Th yes, I am. I okay. lost I lost your audio for about 30 seconds. So can you just recheck your audio? And then we can try and do that middle bit again. Sure, can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So that last okay. bit, that last minute, we, we lost you. Okay, so basically what I'm going to say is that the long-term uh, neutral rate has come down from about 2% to about one and a quarter percent. So even if the Fed goes hawkish short-term and says we're going to raise rates sometime this year, the, long, the, the longer-term forecast is they're probably only going to raise rates two or three times max, and then they're done. It's not, it's not like the 11 rate hikes of the, of the previous cycle or anything like that. So you'll, you'll, that, you'll, that's how we'll probably see a balanced report come out of the Fed this time. So what you're saying is essentially these dots will come lower and they'll they'll instead of yes. being around three and a half, three percent, they'll be around two, two and a half going out to yes, two thousand and eighteen. We'll the whole thing run. shift. Yeah, I think we'll see the whole thing shift downward. And that'll be important too, that uh, mm. that even though there's not much more easing, we're not looking at a huge amount of, of tightening initially anyways. They need to do a little bit but uh, but it's not like pre it's not like previous cycles. They they will also be up so here as Michael has Go ahead, Michael. They will also be updating their economic projections. And these are the projections that they came out with on the June meeting. So um, they're targeting 2% GDP growth for 2016. And that was down from 2.2% in March. Now, were you going to sort of finish up? Because I was just about to go off at a tangent uh, yes. there. Go on. Finish sure. I just wanted to mention... 
one quick thing. So yeah, so we might see so signals here would be an increase in the core PC inflation, or if they start to move back up on GDP, which I think would be tough for them to do because the OECD came out this morning and they cut their U.S. Uh, GDP growth forecast to one point to one point four from one point eight. Now on the other hand, we've had all kinds of various uh, conflicting numbers out of the U.S. in terms of whether their economy has rebounded or not over the summer. So it will be interesting to see what the Fed thinks and do they use GDP or employment or inflation to uh, to signal towards a December rate hike. And I think I think that is the key component of this. I'm going to just shut this down. And you do, do you need this anymore, Colin? This particular. Uh, no, I'm good. Okay, so let me actually I'll just minimise it. Okay, now there's something that we we were talking about potentially. Um, what the Fed could signal in terms of a December rate rise. Now, there's something on the CMC Markets website that actually is quite useful. And it's, the econo it's called the Economic Calendar. Now, we have a comparison function on the Economic Calendar. And this is the annual GDP, annual growth rate for the United States. So ultimately, the question that I think everyone needs to ask themselves and I think it's particularly relevant at this time. This is the US GDP chart of annual growth. Now, since 2015, March 2015, when the GDP annual growth rate was 3.3%, growth rate was 3 .3%, GDP in the US has been declining every single quarter since then. Now, they're targeting 2% GDP growth for 2016. The current trend growth up to the end of the last quarter, Q2, is 1.2%. And we'll get the final revision of that GDP number at the end of next week. Now, what we've seen thus far in terms of economic data out of the US for Q3 hasn't been great. Non-farm payrolls for July was fairly good, but August came in 151. And the ISM manufacturing and the ISM services numbers for August were very disappointing. If you actually look at the GDP numbers for 2016, actual GDP, US GDP is trending at 0.9%. So for the, the Federal Reserve to hit its 2% GDP target for 2016, you're going to need a significant amount of outperformance in September, October, November and December. The big question is, is that likely and the second question is, is that likely if the Fed raises rates? Because ultimately, a higher rate acts as a tightener on the US dollar and actually could push the dollar up at a time when US exporters are finding that the strength of the dollar is a problem. Another thing that I would like to quick, quickly show you is the contrast between US GDP and UK GDP. So here we've got a situation where UK GDP is actually rising and US GDP is falling, and yet we're talking about a US rate hike and a, and a Bank of England rate cut. If that's not an oxymoron, I don't know what, is, what isn't. Anyway, that's on the news and analysis section of the CMC Markets website. It's a very useful feature. It's just been added, and, and, and I think it, it's, it's quite powerful. So let's move on to uh, the let's move on to uh, euro dollar or the, or the Fed decision tonight. So we, we've talked about that. And we've talked about essentially what the Fed is likely to do tonight if in the event they decide to keep rates unchanged. Because I think the big outlier here is the presidential election, which is now 48 days away. 48 days away. And Clinton and Trump are pretty, pretty neck and neck in the polls. And while you'd like to think that the US voters wouldn't vote for Donald Trump. A lot of people thought that the UK wouldn't vote for Brexit. So um, I don't think there's any, anything, uh, any such thing as a done deal here. The problem at the moment, I think, for, for the US voters is the fact that Donald Trump is pretty unappealing, but Hillary Clinton isn't, is only, only slightly less, <laughs> only slightly less unappealing. <laughs> Uh, and I think well, there's a lot of Americans who think she should be in jail. So yeah, yeah, and, and unfortunately, that highlights the polarities. I think not only I think in the U.S. economy, but pretty much highlights the splits, the polarizations, the populism that we're seeing here in the U.K., what we're seeing in Europe, 
as a result, I think of I think some some part of it is due to um, political incompetence, but an awful lot of it is also down to central bank um, monetary policy, which is helping basically boost the haves to the exclusion of the have-nots. And um, I agree. You know that 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 that's going. Yeah, that's, and that's I a think this. Yeah, and it's it's important because I think. In a lot of ways, this Fed decision is actually quite – could be taken as becoming politically charged whether they mean it to or not because historically the Fed tries to stay uh, uh, away from politics and, uh, and, and, and basically right to, away from it. But you've had actually recently – Donald Trump has been uh, accusing the Fed of uh, keeping the interest, rate, interest rates artificially low to help the Democrats, uh, which is, is quite interesting. The um, – and, and so, if they do take it, uh, if they do hold today, you could see more comments out of uh, out of Trump. Of course, also if you if you keep rates low and, and send the signal, well, gee, the U.S. economy is still too weak for the that we can't raise interest rates. That they could then take that as an example of America is broken and we need to fix it. Whereas actually, a rate hike could be seen as, as favoring the Democrats on the basis that you can say, yeah, the economy is doing great, it's fantastic, we're raising rates anyways, and Democrats' economic policies can or Clinton can say and Obama can say, well, our economic policies are working. So, so it's actually uh, even regardless of what they do, somebody's going to take a political read off of this today. And so they're actually trading on some fairly thin ice here, even as it is. And even as though normally you'd want to just push it off till after the election and, and, and stay out of the whole thing. I think it doesn't matter what they do. So I think it doesn't matter what they do. So they're going to end up getting caught up in it anyways. Yeah, I think that's the problem. They're damned if they do, and they're damned if they don't. Ultimately, I think Absolutely. In, in the wake of Jackson Hole, I think there had been an expectation that the Fed would raise today. Um, unfortunately, the economic data hasn't been playing ball. And unfortunately, I think there's an element of Fed credibility here, because at the beginning of this year, we were talking about the prospect of four rate rises. Now, you know that I've been very, very sceptical that we'd probably um, see even half that, Colin. And at the moment, it looks... To, to my mind, as if, as if that could well be the case, but ultimately the Fed will be the, the, the you know the Fed is in a no-win situation here. If they raise rates, they invite political criticism. If they leave well alone, they invite political criticism. But ultimately, I think what what I think is important amongst above everything else is what the price action is telling you, and the price action is telling Absolutely. me is that the dollar is likely to remain under pressure. And if the dollar is likely to remain under pressure, you then in, you then extrapolate that as to how that will how that will unfold. And the only way that I can see that unfolding is if the Fed is dovish in its statement, if it does raise rates, or if it puts off a rate rise and tries to keep December on the table. The problem with keeping December on the table is if Donald Trump gets in. There's no way they're raising rates in December. No way. Because I think the markets will take fright if Donald Trump wins the presidential election. And that could cause That's an awful right, even though he would, Even though he would be pushing the Fed to raise rates, I think you're right. I think you'd see the... Uh, the market react negatively to it, and they haven't yet, right? We've seen that uh, the markets have been quite complacent about this, uh, about the prospects of uh, Trump winning election uh, throughout this year, and uh, and the reality is uh, otherwise that you know. The, um, a lot of the people out there also uh, in the media and, and the markets would be thinking that Hillary Clinton would be winning by 20 points by now, and she's not, yeah. which means it's a lot closer election. This is going a lot more like the Brexit campaign did than uh, – and, uh, and the Larkers could be in for a big surprise. Yeah. So, I mean, I think in, to summarize what we expect from today's Fed meeting is that Janet Yellen generally tends to be a fairly cautious central banker. I think unless she's unless she's steamrolled into a rate hike by her more hawkish colleagues, then I think her caution, her propensity for caution will outweigh um, any hawkish concerns that the rest of the committee may have. You may see some dissent on the committee. Mester has already, I think, dissented. Is it Center, Is it Mester or George? It's one of the two. 
uh, George just sent it in. I wouldn't be surprised if Mester does as well. Yeah. So and you... The one that will be interesting to me is that, and you're absolutely right, Yellen is very cautious, and, and I suspect Fisher will probably be pushing for a rate hike. So the question, so the one I think it's going to come down to is probably Dudley, mm. and because he was the one in August that tripped everybody over because he's been dovish for most of the year, mm. and he was the one that kind of started to switch sides in August, and the question is, would he be that, will he push it through or will the uh, will the neutral side win it? Will he get say offset by Brainerd or, or something like that? I think I think don't underestimate Lael Brainerd. I think she carries more clout mm, than most people think. A lot of people haven't heard of her, but she's I think she is well regarded, and I think Yellen listens to her probably more than she does Fisher. That yeah, that being said, you're right about that. let's look at the charts. The other one is Williams, and he was starting to lean hard. She leans and listens to Williams, I think. Yeah, but he's too. he's not he's not a voting member, so and he's for, not a voter this year. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's look at the charts because one thing I did notice. So we're going to look at cable in a minute because I find that very interesting because we're approaching a very key support on sterling dollar on the four-hour chart, linking the lows from July, and we're currently just above that. And I think while we hold above that, I think sterling strength could well outweigh um, any dollar strength there but what what has been particularly interesting is that gold what's happened with gold today now we've been trading sideways in a slightly downward channel since we peaked in July but what we've seen today I found actually very interesting indeed because we got an initial sell-off lower in the wake of the Bank of Japan rate decision and I can't really account as to why that happened I'm looking at a 10 minute chart here but since then we've gone full reverse and we've gone full reverse all the way back up to one thousand three hundred thirty dollars an ounce and one thing that despite all the dovishness from central bankers and all the dovishness um, you know about easier monetary policy central banks have been buying gold steadily all of this year and actually if you look at what gold has done this year it's actually um, done fairly well it's up around about 25 percent and since July it's been trading sideways albeit in a very gradual downtrend but with very very solid support all the way through here at 1300 and I think that for me is key I think if gold holds above 1300 then the dollar is unlikely to strengthen that much and that for me suggests that we could well see dollar weakness and currency strength against it we're seeing it in dollar yen already um, in terms of what we saw this morning we are now seeing it in gold and that suggests to me that for all the bullishness about the dollar I think the line of least resistance is that we could well see more dollar weakness over the course of the rest of the year um, similar sort yes, of story and also Michael go on oh sorry can I just add, uh, even here with the dollar index around 95, 96, the market's already pricing in one or two rate hikes this year. Even if we do have the Fed lean towards a short-term rate hike, that's probably not going to push the dollar up very far. That's very true, actually. I, I always say that. Now go on. I'm just. I gonna... think at 96, you're still pricing in two hikes this year, or two hikes within, say, the next uh, 12 months. Okay, what you you talk away because I'm just about to bring up a dollar index chart because I actually think that this dollar index chart speaks volumes as to what's been happening. Just going to bring my Bloomberg across. Um, Absolutely. So what we've seen with the U.S. dollar uh, over the course of this year is it has been weakening. Uh, but you'll recall back at the beginning of the year it was at par at 100, and that was up when people were thinking there were going to be four rate hikes uh, in, in 2016, and that obviously hasn't happened. And my feeling has been that if you're looking out over the course of a year, at, at 90, you're pricing in zero, 92, and a, 92, 93, you're pricing in one, 95 is two, 97 is three, and, and 100 is four. So in this 94 to 96 area, you're likely pricing in two uh, t I was I was using up until recently say two rate hikes this year I think it's two rate hikes over the next 12 months the um, the interesting thing is if the Fed did decide to raise rates today they actually should have raised rates back here back in June and I think everybody now will pretty much admit that they should have but they didn't know what was going to happen with the brexit vote and more importantly what it was going to mean for the markets and the world economy well the impact turned out to be quite shallow and quite brief so it ended up that the uh, the Fed didn't have to worry about it, but who knew that at the time? So if you get a rate today, it's really the catch-up from June more than, than they actually need one 
uh, from now if you're looking at a program of once every six months. If they hold, they hold off till December, then maybe you'll get another one in, in June of 2017. You're probably looking at, at six months. Uh, to, I think their program would be probably six months between rate hikes and just that they've missed one now. So, And the other question is if they do raise rates today, then maybe the next one comes in March six months from now. Indeed. And also looking at this dollar index chart, you can see that actually from where we were, let's say, in the, at the beginning of August to where we are now, we've already seen a significant tightening effect in terms of the US dollar. We're at the highest levels that we've been at for around about a month now. And actually, we've only ever been higher very initially at the beginning of August. Uh, and obviously these peaks here in July. Just seen crude oil, crude oil, crude, crude oil inventories fell 6.2 million barrels. That's a big, big fall. So I think oil. you'll see oil spike sharply on that. Um, we're expecting a build of 2.6. So again, that's going to see a significant... <laughs> Yes, you're going to see a significant. Yeah, yeah you've got a big spike for crude oil. It's up uh, 60 cents in the last two minutes from yeah, yeah. Uh, from 44.30 to 44.90, and so we'll probably see oil rolling upward here on this news because it is a a big positive surprise. Yeah, there we go. So if I do the daily chart there, well, you've, you've, also, you've also got to put it in the context of also where we've been over the course of the past few days and weeks, and we are. We've, we're just coming off two-week lows, so you would think you would think that basically there's an awful lot of short positions out there in terms of where we've been to and where we were at the beginning of September. So it looks like we could see a significant rebound, but if you look at where crude's what crude's done over the course of the past few days and weeks, there's plenty of scope for us to go higher and keep the downtrend that's been in place since the June peaks well intact. So, so, so certainly I think f from the prospect of crude oil probably going to see a little bit of a spike higher doesn't change the overriding demand picture supply and demand dynamics um, of crude oil um, we've seen we've seen a decent rebound certainly got scope to potentially go a little bit higher maybe come back to around about forty eight dollars a barrel which is around these sorts of levels here going slightly off topic there um, for a minute and I've, and I've lost Colin I think I think he's um I think he's had too much mic trouble um, for his own for his own good. Oh, he's back now. Um, I wondered where you'd gone there. Oh, for sorry about that. That's all right. I just suddenly saw the red cross come up. So so basically, crude. I was just saying, crude oil inventories. We've just been trading off two week lows. So I think there's a certain element of um, a short covering going on there. Um, I and, would agree. And there was a little bit of pre buying ahead of that anyway, after um, after the um, inventory data that we saw out of the API yesterday, which came in. With a surprise, surprise was it a surprise um, draw as well? Yes, it was a surprise drawdown, and it was certainly bigger than uh, than people were thinking. And and on top of that, now we've got this big uh, conference in Algeria this weekend with all kinds of rumors back and forth of you know could Russia and OPEC agree to a one year deal? Uh, do they even need to come up with a deal? Will they even f still be speaking to each other at the end of the meeting? And if they do come up with a deal, will they just cheat on it anyways? Uh, the possibility of an emergency OPEC meeting next week, if they actually make any progress, which remains to be seen. But uh, certainly this has uh, this has put some fundamental support in underneath the oil price now heading into the weekend when we're going to have all this speculation around have all this speculation around what happens at uh, at this week's conference. And also, so we'll likely have the pipe boiling right into next week. Absolutely, and I think if you also look at this WTI chart that I've got here, it's been quite it's been quite noticeable that we've bounced off bounced off a very significant support level um, on the WTI contract, and it's always a very very good idea to look at the two and how they correlate Brent and WTI. I always tend to do that, just so that I know that if we do see a break, if it's confirmed on the other chart, and we could see that it wasn't in the case of Brent. Uh, or in the case of WTI, we actually bounce pretty much to the to the to the dollar to the cent off this support level here around about forty two dollars and forty cents. So that's a key level there. Why is it key? Because ultimately it acted as support there. It acts as a little bit of resistance through here and support there, and it also coincides with this nice little trend line from the February lows here. So now we've got three touches in the uptrend on crude oil from the lows in February. So 
very much the trend is your friend here very strong support here if we do break through 4240 then I think you could see a very sharp ratchet down again technical analysis the chart the prices are telling you what what the fundamentals maybe are not telling you and I think in that context it's very very important that you look at the charts and then try and formulate an opinion based on what you think the charts are going to do now um, let's have a quick look at US markets because I think US markets are going to be very very driven by what the Fed does later today and certainly I think if you look at the S&P 500 you can see we've seen an awful lot of choppiness in recent days we've had pretty much all over the summer it was a bit like watching paint dry very very um, very very small ranges very very tight ranges bit of sideways consolidation we had a very sharp down move uh, uh, couple of weeks ago and, and then it was followed by a very quick sharp up move but what we do appear to be seeing here is resistance at 2160 why have I chosen that it's quite simple if we look at a line through these lows here we can sort of see straight away that there is a significant area of what I would call confluential support now that may seem a bit of a flowery way of basically saying but if you look at the number of times the market has bounced off 2160 over the course of the last three months we can see that it is a very significantly important pivotal area in terms of support and resistance and I think that's why it's important that you bear it in mind if we get a surprise from the Fed today also on the downside 2135 decent support 2160 decent resistance those are your key levels for the S&P 500 in the event of a surprise from the Fed later today let's extrapolate those out onto the Dow Jones the the US 30 slightly more difficult to really draw any conclusions on that because it's not immediately apparent where the support and resistance levels are but at first glance it's a fairly similar chart in terms of where the support and resistance levels are but ultimately it's probably a little bit less reliable um, certainly in terms of the fact that the Dow is so heavily weighted towards companies like Apple and Exxon therefore a move in one of those share prices is likely to skew it quite significantly to the detriment of all the others so you look at look at the Dow it does still look a little bit soggy and what I would hope to see I think on the Dow is for a recovery um, through these these peaks here that we've seen over the course of the past three or four days of 18,260 18,260 and support around about 18,000. Um, Colin I know you wanted to cover the RBNZ before we sign this off so do you want to go ahead and do that? Sure, absolutely. So three hours after the Fed meeting, we get this month's uh, meeting's decision from the RBNZ. The, the street is expecting them to hold interest rates at 2%. They cut a quarter point at their last meeting down from 2.25%. Uh, since then, uh, New Zealand economic data has been mixed. Australia economic, economic data has been mixed. Uh, we look a lot at how the, what the RBNZ does relative to what the RBA does. So the RBA held their interest rate steady at their last meeting, and they were pretty neutral in their statements. So uh, all in, it looks as though the Kiwis are going to keep their uh, interest rate steady this time as well. Now, their dollar has picked up a bit in the last few weeks as US dollar has weakened so they do sometimes try to talk their dollar down you may see them have another go uh, at that I'd be more concerned about that if it was up closer to 75 it's just above uh, 70 73 but basically Kiwi dollar has been tracking higher into this meeting the uh, the street is expecting them to remain neutral and uh, and that's pretty much where we're at with that. But it does tend to trade quite a bit around the decision. So the decision comes out at 5 p.m. Eastern time. That's 10 p.m. in London. And uh, New Zealand dollar, U.S. dollar does tend to be active around these around these developments. On that note, we might as well have a quick look at the Aussie dollar and look at where we are with respect to that. And that's certainly a very interesting chart on the Aussie. If I change that to a weekly chart, we can see how very important that upper line on the Australian dollar is. This is on a weekly chart. The 2013 peaks at the moment has managed to contain the recent rebounds in the Australian dollar. So we can see straight away that we've got a significant area of resistance coming through between 76.5 and, 
and 77. So I think if we get a decent, um, if we get a particularly dovish Fed or a particularly dovish outcome, I think you could see the Australian dollar um, push higher quite significantly and that will give the RBA a significant headache because the last thing they want is a stronger Aussie dollar and you could well see a further rate cut from the RBA by the end of the year. Okay, what I'm going to do yes, now... Yes, I think that's reasonable, and the dollars are important that way, both the Aussie and the Kiwi dollar. They're both quite concerned about them going up too much too quickly. Okay, so on that note, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do, if anyone has any questions about any of the currency pairs or anything that we haven't covered, I'd like to throw it open to you now. So if you want to ask any questions uh, uh, here by basically replying to this message that I've just about to send out. Otherwise, Colin and I will wrap this up and wish you all the best um, in trading in and around tonight's Fed rate decision. Yeah, there's been a lot of uncertainty heading into this, so there's a good chance that people are going to be surprised, and regardless of what happens, we'll probably see quite a bit of market action around the uh, around the decision. And and we can see it in phases too. Often we'll get an initial wave of reaction on on liquidity. Was it is it good for a liquidity hawkish or dovish? And then later on you start to see other moves based on what does it mean for the economy and for corporate earnings. So we can see quite a bit of uh, trading action and swings in both directions off of today's developments indeed we indeed we certainly will and we also have to remember that obviously Europe will have gone home London will have gone home so it'll probably be quite thin and it will be quite choppy so please be careful out there anyway thanks very much for your thanks very much for listening I'm going to wind this up now um, wrap it up and then post it on YouTube um, within the next couple of hours. Thanks very much for listening. Oh, question on Aussie dollar. Um, given the fact that many analysts aren't expecting a rate hike and moderate hawkish tone, will Aussie dollar rally? Well, again, I think there's a decent chance of that, but I think it really depends. If they do hold, then I think they will have to try and at least keep the option of a rate rise on the table. But at the same time, they don't want the dollar to rally too sharply. So Mrs. Yellen's got a significant balancing act to adopt. And I think it will be interesting to see how she fends off some of the questions in the press conference vis-a-vis -vis the fact that earlier this summer she said that she expected to see rates go up by the end of the summer. We're now at the end of the summer and we're still yet to see a rate hike. I think I said rate cut there, I meant rate hike. Hopefully that answers your question. If you have any other questions and you want to contact Colin or myself, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at mhewson underscore cmc. Colin is at ccizinski underscore cmc. Um, otherwise, thanks very much for listening, and um, uh, yeah, just just be careful out there. Don't you know? Don't lose any money. Thanks, Michael, and thanks everyone. Have a great day trading. Cheers, Colin.